What makes a scientific process distinctive is the importance placed on reproducible fact. Through experimentation and testing, new evidence is often discovered, and as a result, old scientific theories are changed or even discarded. Even failed hypotheses lead to new and better understandings of our world. I'm neuroscientist Dr. Crystal Dilworth, and today on VOA Tech, we give you a close-up look at how the scientific process is conducted. In this case, it's a research study of a new and non-invasive treatment to possibly help a young man regain some quality of life after suffering a traumatic brain injury. Will this new treatment help him in any way? A team of scientists are working together to find out. Powering the future, confronting the world's challenges with cutting edge solutions, medical breakthroughs and high tech discoveries. These are the stories of our planet. This is VOA Tech. Shani, open your eyes. <laughs> open your eyes. The power of a mother's love Bigger. for her son. Bigger, mommy here. Smiley. Hi, smiley. <laughs> Youngju Kim is the mother of 25-year-old Sean. He is in a minimally conscious state and needs constant care. Almost four years ago, Sean was a student at the University of California, Los Angeles, when he accidentally fell from the second floor of a building. The fall caused a traumatic brain injury that put Sean in a coma for several weeks. Before the accident, Sean, who grew up in Chicago, was an accomplished student and athlete. My son is like a very uh, fun and very healthy, like uh, everything he, uh, he enjoyed. Very positive, very active. He played piano. He started uh, playing tennis. So he uh, pretty enough his uh, strength and his body is very uh, good for like any athletic. And so many uh, uh, teachers, coach recommended you can be a tennis player, a, a basketball player, but he choose tennis play. So he did uh, tennis play uh, seven years. And uh, during the high school, he's a varsity team. He play single and double. We travel all over state in the United States. I drove him everywhere. But suddenly happened, he decided uh, he wants to go to a college, a warm area, because he said one day, Mom, Chicago is too cold. I'm living here too long. I want to stay warm area. Despite his mother's wishes to attend an East Coast college, Sean was accepted to UCLA to study economics and business. As a student, he became an entrepreneur with dreams of traveling the world, perhaps starting a food business. He uh, traveled to Japan. He visited the Fuji Mountain on Tokyo Street and uh, like a sauce taste he started. And he stepped by uh, Korea. He then returned to Los Angeles to complete his course of study at college. The accident occurred on October 13th, 2018. This happened in his senior year at UCLA. Senior year. So he'd been there for three full years. You describe a very like robust personality. He's traveling, he loved food, he was loved life. And then he loved life, that. he loved people, he loved eat, he loved he loved everything, very energetic, healthy, positive, like an independent person. Since the accident, Sean has made some progress, but his mom is hoping for more. He is now a part of a 10-day study to understand if a new experimental treatment could help improve his condition. I'm here at Casa Colina Hospital, where scientists are about to embark on a brand new clinical trial. 
They're testing an experimental new therapy that might help jumpstart the brains of minimally conscious patients. The process of science is the creation of new knowledge. And when it's never been done before, scientists don't know until they try. But experiments like this one make critical contributions to our understanding of how the brain works. And patients like Sean are counting on it. Dr. Martin Monti is a neuroscientist and professor at UCLA. He's the co-principal investigator of the study called Low Intensity Focused Ultrasound Pulsation that Sean is a part of. What state did he come in at and what are you hoping to see in terms of possible improvement? Well, this patient, I remember seeing this patient uh, a few years ago in the ICU at UCLA. Uh, he had just suffered a severe traumatic brain injury due to a fall from a height. Um, and at the time, the patient was in a coma. Now, fast forward a few years later, uh, the patient is showing some signs of uh, being uh, self-aware, which means we would say that he is in a, in a minimally conscious state, which means if you ask him, he will, um, maybe inconsistently, but he will respond. Um, so you might ask him to make a gesture, and, and he will, um, again, if inconsistently, he will make some response. Before we get to the clinical trial that Dr. Monty is conducting with Sean, it's important to understand what happens to the brain after an injury. The brain is about three to four pounds of extremely delicate soft tissue floating in fluid inside the skull. Traumatic brain injury, or TBI, can occur after a blow or jolt to the head by physical force, such as a car accident, or in Sean's case, a fall that causes the brain to move around violently in the skull, damaging the tissue. Concussion can be considered a mild traumatic brain injury. Then, there are the more serious brain traumas that can cause coma and are often followed by a vegetative state where people are awake, but not aware. We're talking about coma, we're talking about traumatic brain injury and disorders of consciousness. But first, I have to kind of maybe ask a simple question. What is, what is a coma and what's the difference between coma and just deep sleep? So disorders of consciousness refers to a basket of conditions. Um, for example, coma, something that most people tend to be familiar with, at least by name. And then a vegetative state and a minimally conscious state. Now. Coma appears from the outside almost as if somebody were in a very deep sleep. Um, of course, the physiology of it, so what's happening in the brain, is profoundly different. So deep sleep is a natural condition which occurs to all of us every night. Uh, and our brain is made to enter that condition and then spontaneously come out of it. A coma, instead, is, uh, is a condition in which the brain doesn't seem able to wake itself up. Even though from the outside it appears just as if it were sleep, it's a very different mechanism. So there's three sort of main types of disorder of consciousness. How do you know the difference between them? Knowing the difference between disorders of consciousness is asks the question of, well, how do you know that anyone is conscious? Uh, and see, it's a very tricky question because if, if you ask me, I, I know I'm conscious. And I'm sure if I ask you, you know you're conscious. What's tricky is, it's hard for you to point at me and say, I'm confident that you are conscious just the same way that, that you feel you are. Um, and so this is, the, this is the difficulty that we encounter with disorders of consciousness. So typically patients will have, will suffer some severe brain injury, maybe a car accident, uh, we see many of those here, uh, or a near drowning. And they will be admitted at some ICU in a coma. So when patients are in a coma, usually they look as if, um, uh, they were sleeping, as we said, and, and they just don't respond to anything around them, other than really basic reflexes. Now, coma never lasts more than, let's say, four weeks. Uh, patients sometimes just regain consciousness fully, and, and you can see it because you can ask them. And, you know, you can ask them, you know, either, either a verbal question or you can ask them to maybe move a foot or, or, or blink or open their mouth, and they will do that for you. Now, some patients, however, wake up to the limbo of a vegetative state. And this is a very complex condition because their eyes open up. It, it looks as if they're finally awake, but they just don't give any sign of being conscious. They don't give any sign that they understand what's happening around them. They don't give any sign that they are conscious of, of who they are and, and what, what circumstance they're in. And that's what's so complicated and fascinating about this condition. Essentially, 
they're awake, but not aware. Dr. Caroline Schnackers is a neuroscientist, clinical trial co-principal investigator, and assistant director of research at the Casa Colina Hospital and Centers for Healthcare. She describes Sean's current condition. This is a severe traumatic brain injury uh, that uh, this patient had. Uh, he uh, fell uh, from a building, uh, and um, um, afterwards he was in a coma. Uh, and uh, right now he's evolving. He's in a minimally conscious state, which means that um, he's not yet fully communicating, but he's responding to command and uh, he's trying to use some code, yes, no code, to communicate with us, but it's unfortunately um, non-systematic, so he cannot use that all the time. Sean is here at Casa Colina Hospital to take part in a clinical trial that will test a new form of treatment using focused ultrasound. It's a non-invasive procedure where ultrasound, the same safe ultrasound waves that are used to create fetal images during sonograms, is focused and applied to the brain. In this case, it's aimed at the thalamus, a part of the brain that regulates consciousness and alertness and relays sensory and motor signals throughout the brain. Dr. Joshua Kane is a neuroscientist working with Drs. Monty and Schnackers on this study at Casa Colina Hospital. So here we're focusing on the central thalamus. In theory, it could be anywhere in the brain, which is amazing. So this, this is a new ability that this technology affords us. There are other non-invasive neuromodulatory techniques that can hit the outside of the brain, but focus ultrasound in theory allows you to hit, in a really selective way, uh, any part of the brain without surgery, non-invasively. But here, um, which is the first clinical application of focus ultrasound, we are attempting to modulate the central thalamus. And it looks like these, uh, these really these central hubs of the brain are, are really crucial to allow someone to maintain a state of consciousness. And so, in the context of this project, that's the part of the brain that we are targeting. Does it work? Well, it's an experimental treatment. Um, and this very project is aimed at, at answering that exact question. Uh, we certainly have really exciting preliminary data. We do see patients being able to express more uh, responsiveness after this type of stimulation. So what we typically see these patients will come in, we will study them carefully for five days, just to make sure we really know where they're at. And then we'll do a session of this. We're taking you into the clinic for a rare look at the scientific process. In trials like these, any data are good data. And even no response to treatment can help these researchers refine the therapy they're testing. The process begins with Dr. Caroline Schnackers doing a detailed assessment of Sean's current state. A little warm up, okay? Um, some movement. And um, I want you to try as much as you can to do it. First, I would like you to move your feet. Try to move your feet as much as you can. Okay, move your feet as much as you can. Voila. That is very good. It's very good. I know you just woke up. <laughs> You're trying to wake up right now, right? It's really good. Um, <clears throat> okay, relax. <laughs> hey, that's the first time I hear your voice. Hey. Hello. Hello to you too. <laughs> Move your feet again. I saw it once, but you know that I need to see it several times. Move your feet as much as you can again. Go for it. That's good. That's really good. That's, that's really good. That's really good. Relax. <laughs> that's wonderful. I think it's the first time I hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do it twice? That's fantastic. That's great. So you see this? What's the name of this? What's the name of this? It's a... Yeah. Yeah. It's a...
It's a b b b. It's a b b. It seems like Sean is attempting to answer with the word ball, but he doesn't quite vocalize it. Next, Dr. Schnackers asks him to touch the ball. Try to raise your hand to touch the ball. Try to raise your hand and touch the ball. Go for it. Yes, go for it. Go for it. Raise your hand. There was no response. Okay. Let's try something else, okay? I'll take your hand. <clears throat> you feel the ball here? Okay. Could you open your fingers? Try to open them wide for me to put the ball. Could you do that for me? After several attempts with no response, Dr. Schnackers moved on to a different test. Try to stick out your tongue then. Yeah, I see. Try to put out, stick out your, your tongue. Stick out your tongue. Show it to me, I want to see it. That is very good. Yeah. <laughs> I see it. It's pink, beautiful. That was successful. The results of all the tests are recorded during the examination. Can you tell me some of the things you look for when you're scoring? You need to observe a, a, a movement uh, that is different than what you observe spontaneously several times. So often it's hard to say if it reflects when it's observed only once. But if it's observed, for example, three out of four times, at that point it's most likely purposeful. You explore <laughs> pretty much what the patient can and can't do. Um, and it's important to have a good baseline or a good understanding of what a patient can do before the treatment. Dr. Snackers concluded Sean's examination after 30 minutes of testing. So um, what you just saw, it's typical of uh, uh, many, many conscious states. Here simply he's able to show some signs of consciousness. So he's able, when I um, ask him to do something, he will do it, not all the time. It would take effort for him, a lot of effort to do it but he will be able to do it maybe three times out of four. He's showing that he understands to some point language. Um, and so that make him in a minimally conscious state, MCS plus, because he's able to respond to command. Is there anything that you personally do to create a relationship with the patient <laughs> so that these assessments yeah. can be easier? First, I have been doing this for more than 15 years. So I have a certain rapport with this patient that is created easily, more easily, because I have been seeing this patient for so long. So it is very important indeed to create a rapport with the patient. And if they feel connected to you, you will have more chances to actually have or see um, a response uh, to what you ask them to do. The next part of the study is an electroencephalogram, known as an EEG. This test detects the overall electrical activity of the brain. We're gonna put the EEG on. Dr. Kane puts a cap on Sean's head that has 64 electronic sensors. It's painless and causes Sean no discomfort. Um, it's measuring brain waves. <laughs> so little tiny changes in electrical activity in the brain, uh, which are very small, but uh, they're all referenced to one of these electrodes and so the difference between these two, even though it's very small, you can pick that up and infer things about the brain from that. It takes time and patience to ensure all the electrodes can read Sean's brain waves. A special gel is added to help make the connections. How do you know when you get good contact? Well, you'll see that these turn green. Huh. Yeah. But first we need to get the ground. Okay. And the reference down, then they'll start turning green. 
Dr. Kane, and registered nurse Jeanette Goomerang continued to add conductive gel until all the electrodes turned green. Um, can you turn your head towards me? Just turn towards me gently. Very good, very good. Dr. Monty joins the team, and the EEG is recorded. One of the things that we look at with EEG um, are some specific features that are fairly typical of patients such as Sean. And often they tend to be a little bit slower in these kind of patients. And, and one of our hypotheses is that these rhythms after the ultrasound and after a few days typically become a little bit faster, which is what we're seeing. So this is our initial point of comparison. And then, of course, we compare the rhythms right now to the rhythms after the ultrasound and then a few days later. Now, doctors Monty and Kane are ready to prep Sean for the actual experimental treatment of the low-intensity focused ultrasound pulsation. A tracking device is placed on Sean's head that will help target the ultrasound beam. And see there, there's a red square and a green square. So the green square means that this now is how the computer know where his head is. So what this is doing is telling, uh, in relation to this tracker, where the focus of the ultrasound beam will be, basically. So we're just uh, calibrating that. Okay, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, both in. Yep. Begin calibration. Five, four, three, two, one. Sampling. Good. So now the computer knows where the head is and knows when Josh will put the transducer by Sean's head. The computer will know where the focus of the ultrasound is. So that's how we target in real time using the MRI. Um, are there parts of the brain that are more or less difficult to target? Um, theoretically, no. But with the kind of technology that we use, which is known as a single channel transducer, it means that there's really one element that is producing ultrasound. Um, we have to sort of, we, we penetrate the head through a thinning in the temporal bone, which is kind of the thinnest part of the bone, and so it makes it the easiest for the ultrasound to pass through without getting uh, shifted around or reduced excessively. And so in a sense, for now, we're slightly limited to parts of the brain we can hit by putting the transducer here and kind of moving it around. For our work, thalamus is, is almost a straight shot. Over time, Josh has really perfected the, the art of uh, administering ultrasound. Yeah, nobody else really does this, so we had to come yeah. up with all of this. Yeah. Yeah. So this device is going to show the timing is just a timer um, sort of of the whole. So we administered this over 20 minutes. It's 10 minutes of actual ultrasound administered over 20 minutes. We're going to administer it in little, little blocks of 30 seconds with intervals of 30 seconds in between. And so this really tells you when the ultrasound is actually functioning. Ultrasound is a very safe technique. And this machine right in here is going to emit really a uh, an electrical pulse at the right timing, which is going to reach the ultrasound transducer. And essentially, the ultrasound transducer is nothing but a converter. It has a what is known as a piezoelectric element. It's a little, it's a very nifty technology that converts <clears throat> electricity in, vibrations out. Like for us, we just, instead of sort of scattering out the ultrasound, we just target it. So really, we just emit ultrasound. Dr. Kane places the ultrasound unit near Sean's head and carefully aims it with the help of the trackers and computer. He will stay in this position for 20 minutes as a low-intensity focused ultrasound pulsation treatment begins. Perfect, you right on. Five, four, three, two, one. As Dr. Monty described, the ultrasound is now being administered every 30 seconds with a 30 second off interval. After 20 minutes, the treatment is complete. Three, two, one. Off. Well done, George. Excellent. So now we're going to take this off, clean him up a little bit in gel, put the cap back on, redo all the impedances, which is where we look at all the colors, and, uh, and do another, another EG. We're going to give him a little break after that. And then Dr. Schnackers will come back and do another assessment after. Seventy-two hours later, we returned with Dr. Schnackers as she did an assessment to determine if the treatment had any impact on Sean's condition. 
All right, so what are we doing today? Yeah, so we are actually assessing the patient after 72 hours uh, of the treatment. Uh, it's, um, it has been several days that the patient has been assessed uh, with the same tools. And so we are trying to see if in the last window, the last day of a response, the patient is responsive a little bit more. Dr. Schnackers conducts the same tests we saw before the treatment. Okay. Could you move your sheet? Try to take the ball. Try to raise your hand and take the ball. Could you open your fingers to take the ball? Open your fingers. Open your fingers. Look at your face in the mirror. Sean. Open your mouth and stick out your tongue. Say, uh, Sean, could you move your hand? Could you move your hand? Sean, move your fingers. I see that. Move your fingers more. Could you do a thumb up? Yeah. Thumb up again. Okay, that's very good. You've been working on this therapy for for many years. Many years, more than 15 years. What does it take to kind of stay in there and, and keep having hope every day? The point to which these patients um, are devastated and their families, um, there are so much that could be done to improve their quality of life or um, even the family and the caregiver quality of life. Um, the, there is so much in stake here. I really believe that if these treatments are working for these patients, they should work also for less severe brain injury. So that might actually apply to a much larger group of patients. And um, these treatments really need to be developed in order to better treat traumatic brain injury and other type of severe acquired brain injury. What does it take from you as a researcher <laughs> to do this kind of work? Love. <laughs> I love what I do. I, I'm passionate. I, 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 I really try to, my heart is into what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, not seeing any improvement is, is hard, but in the same time, this is data that we can use to better understand how this treatment works. So I really believe that these patients can be helped better. Um, there is hope for them. Uh, and I think there is a momentum here right now uh, that takes place. So there's a little bit of effort for everyone. We can do something together. I really believe in that. Five, four, three, two, one. Research conducted by dedicated scientists like those we met today will continue to incrementally add to the library of scientific knowledge. But we leave this clinical trial at Casa Colina Hospital right where we began in the room where the power of love from Sean's mother continues to work hand in hand with science. I believe energy. A mother and son, we connected. He's from my, my body. He's my body. When I give him like a positive energy give to him, I think all universe is moving. I believe so. Then when I give him positive energy, he can take it. He need, he need love. He doesn't know what happening. One time, one second, got an accident. We can do it. We can do it with love.